Amen. And he is a great God, is he not? Amen. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're a little thin in our numbers of cold weather keeps people from pulling those blankets back. <laughs> we had a full house for a wedding last night. Uh, also, just to, many of you already know about uh, our brother Chuck Maxey, who had an incident with his heart and other issues that are complicating things that are trying to all work out with him. But, uh, you know, Chuck is such an integral part of all we do around here as a lift leader and even as an elder. He's not on the active cycle right now, but he's also one of the elders of our church and our fellowship. So here's what I want us to do. I want us all to stand together again, and I want us to join hands across the aisles and with each other if you've got somebody you can join hands with, or behind you if you can't go across that center aisle there. Let's just, let's just lift him up as a family. Go ahead and stretch out the aisle across you there if you can. Find somebody to join hands with and pray with. And I'd ask each of us this morning just to offer up a prayer for Chuck and just to lift him to the Lord individually. Whatever's on your heart to pray to the Lord, just whisper it out to him now. And then I'll lead us in just a moment in a word of prayer. But you go ahead and just pray first and foremost between you and your Heavenly Father. Let's just lift our brother up to the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord. Precious Lord Jesus, Lord, uh, the one in our family is suffering. Lord, it affects every one of us. And I want to lift up Chuck to you this morning. And I know you're present. Lord, there's been so many prayers we've been bathing him with. But God, we want to collectively in this moment join our hearts and hands with yours, with friends and with family, with Carly who's there. And I just ask you, Father, in the precious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we know your love for Chuck abounds. Lord, ours does as well. And we're asking you for a supernatural hand of mercy and grace to be placed upon him today. God, you would guide those doctors and technicians and attendants to his need, God, by your supernatural hand. God, that you would just move and minister to Chuck's physical well-being today. You who are Jehovah Roth would reach down in this moment with a mighty hand of healing. God, we just lift up the name of Jesus over him now. We stand in agreement with everything that's moving against him, Lord, that is spiritual in nature, Lord. We rebuke and bind it in the name of Jesus. We ask you to come in with such a supernatural touch upon his body, his mind, his organs, Father, his heart today. Just do that which cannot be explained under the banner of medicine. You just have to step back and say, you, Lord, did this. Be glorified. And I pray for our sister Carla to be filled with your spirit today, to take encouragement, to look to you, to trust you, to find your presence near, Lord, to sense your nearness about her today. That even where in the room where they are, God, you just flood it with your presence. We're asking you for your glory to be manifest in his body. It's in Jesus' name we pray this together. All God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. We have a message that's really a continuation of last week's message where we talked about crisis at the crossroads and today's message kind of continues with the children of Israel. This is a little bit prior to them leaving the land of Egypt as we talked about last week where they're out in the wilderness. We're going to back up a little bit to before they're being released. There have been several appeals made to Pharaoh in Exodus that we'll be looking at in a moment in Exodus chapter uh, 8. We're we'll looking at verses 1 through 11. If you want to open your Bible up there, we'll read from it in a moment. But in this passage, you're familiar with the story, obviously. Most of us have been in church for a while. Or like we said, you saw the movie. So you know that Pharaoh has been kind of playing back and forth with the children of Israel and with God ultimately, just saying, I'm going to let him go, but then he doesn't. He changes his mind, and he's going, been going back and forth. And so the Lord's starting to uh, send plagues. I mean, there, this is the plague of frogs, but there was a plague of flies and locusts and gnats, and God, God just bugging them, all right? And <laughs> he's not getting the message yet. And so this is the plague of frogs. There were 10 plagues in all that were sent to the land of Egypt to coerce them and convince them to let God's people go, but they kept rejecting. If we look at this passage of Scripture today, why don't you stand with me as we read and honor the Word of God with our reading this morning. We'll start in verse 1 of this chapter. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, I will smite your whole territory with frogs, and the Nile will swim with frogs, which will come up and go into your house, into your bedroom, they'll be on your bed, they'll be in your houses of your servants, on your people, and into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. 
So the frogs will come up and your people and all your servants. And, the Lord, and then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, am I on the right screen here? <laughs> okay, I thought I'd drop behind there. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and make the frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up, and they covered the whole land of Egypt. And the physicians and the magicians, excuse me, did the same with their secret arts, making frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Well, the honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs may be destroyed from you and your houses, that you may be, they be left only in the Nile? And he said, tomorrow. So he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there's no one like the Lord our God and the frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and your people and they will be only left in the Nile. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. What a mess this becomes, amen? And what a crazy response from Pharaoh that I'll let them go tomorrow. I mean, where's that coming from? Amen. Does that, does that make any sense whatsoever that I'm going to, uh, you know, you can get rid of them tomorrow? Now follow this with me, all right? Because this is an interesting story that uh, it looks a, a little strange and bizarre, but it's very interesting because there are so many parallels to this particular story with our lives and the culture and the world that we're living in today. These are, these are strange days, folks. Amen. And so here we go into this story where these frogs are now covering the land and Pharaoh is saying, all right, get rid of the frogs. When? How about tomorrow? Does that make any sense? Now, if you understand this story correctly, these frogs are everywhere. They're in their houses, they're in their beds, they're in their cooking. Everywhere you go, there is frogs. They are just a constant source of pain and horror. And, and, and I mean, just they're everywhere. You can't get around the frogs. Now, the problem is kind of twofold. One, there are frogs everywhere. Two, you're an Egyptian. It's against the law to kill frogs. Because frogs were worshipped. You know, there was the goddess Hecht, who was the goddess of fertility, so to say, and she's this e e Egyptian goddess, and her name is Hecate or Hex, and uh, she was, had the form of a woman and with the head of a frog. Some of you think, well, I might have dated her. <laughs> From her nostrils, it believed that when she breathed through her nostrils, that it brought life to the the unanimated beings that the god Kanum, the great god who was the creator of, of mankind and animals who dirt and clay would be gathered and by Kanum and he'd fashion these creatures and creation into existence and then through her nostrils she would breathe the breath of life on all these animals, all right? Therefore frogs were sacred. You couldn't kill frogs and even there was the god Happy, H-A-P-I in this whole uh, pantheistic religion, and he was depicted uh, as holding a frog in his hand, and out of the frog's mouth would flow a stream of nourishment that brought life to everything. So frogs were sacred creatures, and this just made the problem worse than you had to that. The magicians are going to do something, and they just bring up more frogs on the land, and all of a sudden, everywhere you look, there's just frogs little slimy amphibious little creatures now, i know that there's a great love for frogs among a lot of people uh, i think it was here in april sometime i believe there was a national frog day here in the united states and i'm sure some of you might have been really in tune with that i, I kind of missed that one uh, also in america you know or at least around the world it's not we not only have an american frog day there is an, an international frog day that took place last month in the world where we celebrated frogs and all the wonder of frogs i'm not a frog guy you might be i'm just not a big frog person you know uh, they're a little slimy and you know I'll, I'll pick a frog up but it's only if i have to move him somewhere he, where, to where he belongs and out of where my presence you know but they're they're pretty gross in my, my mindset especially one or two but when you get a couple hundred thousand million frogs surrounding you everywhere you go then it really becomes a problem can you imagine the crisis that there was in Egypt with these people? Because everywhere they turn, there were frogs. 
Not, not one, not two, they were everywhere. They were in abundance. No matter what you did, you were, you were careful where you sat, you were careful where you went, you were careful where you walked. If you went to sit down in your favorite chair, you sit down, you're gonna have to move some frogs. And then if you're still hearing the ribbits and the croaks, you're gonna have to get up, lift the cushion and take the frogs out from under the cushion. You know, when you get in bed at night and you pull back the sheets, you wanna shake the bed out, why? Because there's gonna be frogs in there. And then while you're sleeping, the frogs are going to come up on the bed. That's, this is not imagination. This is not fantasy. This is what the Bible says. They're every stinking where you look. There's frogs. And it's not, it's not a fun moment. It's not a happy time. It's a miserable time because there are just frogs on every hand. No matter what you did, no matter where you went. If you read the story carefully, it said it'd be in their kneading bowls. In other words, when they took all the flour and were getting ready to knead it into dough, you know, there might be some extra lumps in the flour that weren't flour. They're kind of wiggling around in there, so you've got to extract them out. And then you, you step away, you put in the water, you come back, and you start kneading the dough together, and all of a sudden there's some extra lumps in the dough that weren't there before. You put it in the oven, and the Bible says that they went into their ovens even. So wherever they were cooking even, they got into the food. Can you imagine you're just taking out a big old nice hot loaf of bread and you slice it open and you pull it apart and there's a half a frog on this side and half a frog on this side. This is a miserable way to live your life. It's a disgusting way to live your life. Everywhere they went, you couldn't cook, you couldn't bathe, you couldn't get dressed without there being frogs present on every hand. They're just everywhere, loathsome, tormenting, miserable frogs. And it just wasn't upon the people's house. It was in Pharaoh's house. All right? He had to deal with the frogs. He couldn't just put up a little barrier, call in the frog sprayers, and get rid of the frogs. No, he's dealing with frogs. They're the same problem for him as they are everywhere you're around frogs. In fact, God was making them sick as heck. By the way, that's a joke. All right? So, heck, it was the goddess. Ah, oh, forget it. <laughs> frogs. Nasty, slimy, ugly, green, gross little frogs. God didn't send bears, ravenous wolves, zombies. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't send, you know, a, a herd of buffalo through town. He sent massive amounts of millions and millions and millions of frogs upon the land, and everybody is having to deal with frogs. Everywhere you step, you're stepping on a frog or kicking a frog. They're dying by the hundreds of thousands. The odor and the stench the, 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 from, the, from the dead frogs, little carcasses laying there is rising up in your noses daily. It's a miserable existence. It might have been cute the first day. Oh, look at all the frogs. Until you wake up in the morning and they're staring you in the eyes. You know, it's a bad situation. And so Pharaoh says, had enough. Bring, bring Moses and Aaron in here. And they bring Moses and Aaron in there to face him. And what happens? They get in his presence. Okay. Entreat us. God's given you the final word, Pharaoh. When do you want the frogs to go? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Come on, this is not little orphan Annie singing here. This is... This is, tomorrow? You, don't, you want to put up with this one more evening, one more night, one more day? Through the night again, the same problem, the same stench, the same hassle, the same odor, the dealing of, of every frog and every place we turn. Why do you want to wait one more moment? Now, last week we concluded the sermon about Christ at the crossroad and the priority that we need to realize that is before us about making right decisions, right? And choosing the right path and going the right way. This is the continuation because what happens when that challenge is presented, as it was in Scripture and as it is today, that it's, it's time to follow the Lord. It's time to do what God's called us to do. It's time to be what God wants me to be. Why in the world will we say, not now or some other time or not, not today? Not tomorrow. Why, why are we putting off the very thing that's causing us all this pain and all this heartache? What's the problem? I think we do face a problem, and I think we're facing a problem in our culture, in our nation, and globally, even in the church today, when God is offering us to, to be what 
to, to be experiencing all that he's died that we could experience, all that he rose for that we could experience, we don't experience. We don't have life. We don't have victory. We don't have joy. There's no peace. There's no power in people's lives. They're just going through the motions in so many places in their life. And they're just saying, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going to deal with it tomorrow. I know what God wants me to do. And I, I know what God would have me, how he would have me respond here. But, and I, I know the right thing, but I'm just not ready to do it right now. In fact, there's really about four ways we deal with, with these situations like this. They go kind of like this. The first way, I'll just call it later. The procrastination way. Why, why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? You've heard that saying, right? Hey, folks, procrastination is like a credit card. It's lots of fun until the bill comes, right? And you may be having pleasure in sin for a season, but the bill's going to come. There's going to be a day at what we call payday someday. There's going to be a day when we're going to be, have to be held accountable. And, it, and so the proper answer is not tomorrow. The proper answer is let's do today what God has called us to do today. But what has happened is we've, we've lost our reasoning power. We, you know, it's kind of like paralysis of analysis. We keep thinking about it. We're going to do what God wants, but, it really, but not right now. It, it's really later. On, on the surface, we look at this story and we think, Faye, well, you're out of your mind, right? You're nuts. Why would you go through one more day? But let's take it into our world. Is there something that God's speaking to your heart about? Is there something that God is saying to you? I know what it's like personally to be there, amen? And I think if we get honest, all of us know what it's like to be there when God tells us to do something and we delay or we put it off or we procrastinate and we say, well, not now, but, but later, you know? Most of us are really no different than Pharaoh. We, we linger and we delay when change is really necessary and change is available and the power of God is ready to enable us to be what God's called us to be, but we're still holding on to something. We're still clinging to something of an old life and an old way and an old world, and we're not doing what God's called us to do. I mean, it's tomorrow I'm going to start working on my drinking problem. Tomorrow I'm going to start working on my, my filthy mouth problem. Tomorrow I'm going to tackle my debt. Tomorrow I'm going to start my diet. Tomorrow, I'm going to quit nagging my husband. Tomorrow, I'm going to quit being angry with my wife all the time. Tomorrow, I'm going to start treating her better. Tomorrow, I'm going to do that school assignment. Tomorrow, I get after my homework. Tomorrow, I'll be a better student. Tomorrow, I'm going to look for a job. Tomorrow, I'm going to make that phone call. I know I didn't make that phone call. I keep putting it off. I, I need to make that phone call. But I'll do it. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm going to give my life to God. Tomorrow I'll do what the Lord's leading me to do. I know what he wants me to do, but I, not today. Let, let's just put it off tomorrow. Here's the thing, folks. The things that are giving you the most of the problems in your life, how often it is, those are the very things that we hold on to. Instead of just letting go and letting God really do what he can do and will do in our lives. So we're not just singing songs about it. And we're not just hearing Bible lessons about it, that we're actually enjoying the presence of God. The scripture puts it this way, give no place to the devil. But what have we done? We've given place to the enemy in our life, and we don't think that there's going to be any backfire from that. We don't think there's going to be any cause and effect in that. There's always cause and effect. You know, if, if we choose to resist the Lord, if we choose to rebel against the Lord, if we choose to disobey the Lord, hey, folks, I just want you to know, when, when you choose to make that kind of decision in your life, then you're headed for trouble. And you're headed for a zone of living and a way of living that, that it's not going to be easy for you. It's going to be very difficult for you. All too often, we kind of, we look at the situation that we're in and we think, you know, when I, when I take care of that tomorrow, it's going to be, it's going to really be a lot better. And so things will be right then. But here's the problem. The clock is tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. Tomorrow arrives and we still don't do anything about it. We just let it go one more time. Now we're living. I don't think it, it takes a rocket scientist to figure this out, that we're living in a day of, a, I would just call it tremendous instability. I'm not talking about just spiritually in America and in the culture we live in, it really seems to be worse in America than any place in the world. We're living in a time of tremendous emotional instability and tremendous, I mean, I'm talking about psychological as well, disabilities. We have lost the reason to think correctly. So I, I call that instability, all right? We lost, we lost the reason to reason correctly. I, I think that's instability, especially as Christians when we know right 
We know wrong. We know righteousness. We know unrighteousness. We know God's will versus what's not God's will. And we would still choose to do what our will is instead of God's will. I mean, it doesn't take long. I, I was looking. I, I, I was, got to that point in my sermon. When I finish everything up, I'll, 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 I'll refer to that great theologian, Google. <laughs> and he had something to say, Dr. Google. He said this, and which is, these are all common facts. He said that one in every four Americans experience a mental health disorder in a year. One in four. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Which of us is it? <laughs> or is it one this year and your next year and your next year? You know? But that, that's, that's a hard thing to say when you're talking about that much of the population, 25% of the population will deal with emotional disorders and mental disorders this year alone. And then it's probably the next 25% the next year. 800,000 people will take their own life around the world this year. That's phenomenal. 350 million people worldwide are affected by depression today. They're defeated. They seem hopeless. They're discouraged. And they don't think there's any answers 40 million adults suffer from anxiety disorders in the United States alone. Three and a half million is the number of Americans who are suffering from schizophrenia today. In America, seven people die by suicide every hour. One last thing I thought was quite interesting, it talked about young people in America today, that 11% of adolescents will have a depressive disorder before they reach the age of 18. That's tragic. Whether we realize it or not, it's tragic. But so much of this problems and so, uh, so much of the issues that we're dealing with, and we, brought, we have literally brought them on ourselves because we haven't made right choices and right decisions. And somehow we have this disorder in our brain that says, oh, I can do what I want to do versus what God wants me to do, or I can put it off and it'll still be all right later on. It doesn't get all right. It just intensifies the problem. So there's this number one way I call, it's just the later way I'll put it off. But what happens? Nothing gets better. I mean, think about it. The Bible uses the word sober. Now, a lot of things that we think about is not drinking. Well, that's a good way to stay sober, by the way. Okay, just in case some of you hadn't learned that lesson yet. I don't know why I keep getting drunk. Right? Maybe you keep drinking is a problem. <laughs> That might be a little too simple for some, but trust me, that's the way it works, all right? But there's this word called sober, but it goes beyond just the, the addictions to alcohol and drugs and nicotine and all. I mean, the list is endless, really. You start talking about addictions, is it not? Some of us may have some addictions here. If I were to mention, oh, well, not me. I mean, we start talking about food and things like that. I'm not talking about the necessity of life. I'm talking about gluttony or the other end of the spectrum, you know, the anorexia and all the other things that go along with it. But what's happened? We're no, longer, we're no longer in our right mind. We've forgotten how to think correctly. We actually think that we can do all these things that even your mama told you you shouldn't do, and it's going to be all right. And it's not. We just keep inviting ourselves, and then we keep promoting it in the culture we live in. And, and, and the word, again, the word is sober. It's a word in the, in the Greek language that's made of two Greek words. We say just sober, and, and it was a word, they, it was one word, but it was so friend, and it's made up of two words. Though. The word sof, which means to be safe, all right, to be protected, to be, to be, to be sound. And the other word friend, like we get the word phrenology for mind, to be safe-minded. But not, not a lot of people today are safe-minded. We don't think so as to keep ourselves protected. We don't think so as to be safe. We don't think so as to be, is to, to, is, is to make right decisions, knowing that if I make a wrong decision, it's going to lead to the wrong results in my life. If I take path A, I'm going to have a good result. If I take path B, I'm going to have a bad result. But we would neglect path A and go path B. That means that we're not sober and thinking soberly. The Bible says, be sober for your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, who is that written to? Dear friends, that is written to Christians. It's not written to lost people. Be sober for your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion looking for somebody he can destroy. That's not just written to Christians. That's written to Joe Arms. That's written to you. And we need to take that seriously. 
Do we, not, do we not realize that when we reject God in some regard in our life and just say, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway, that there's not going to be some, you know, reaction to that on, in the spiritual world? Absolutely. All right, absolutely. Satan is just lurking. He's just waiting. He just, and the only way to protect yourself in that regard is learn how to think correctly. Is Pharaoh thinking correctly when he said, hey, when do you want the frogs to leave, Moses? You tell me, uh, Moses, Pharaoh, Moses tells him, you just tell me when it is and we'll get rid of the frogs. And he says, tomorrow. Isn't that the way people handle their problems, though? They think if I just wait one more day, I say, it'll get better, but it's not going to get any better. You know, it just leads to madness. It just leads to more destruction in your life. And what's missing is for us to think properly. Well, well Pastor, what's the, the proper way to think? God's way, God's will, God's word, God's plan, God's path. That's the right way to go. Everything else just invites frogs. <laughs> you just, the land's covered with frogs. Our lives get covered up with frogs. We got issues, and, 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 and you think that it's just going to change. You can't say later. The second way people handle it, and this is a pretty good way for some, I think, but they just, I'm just not going to deal with it. You know, it's the old Frank Sinatra way. I, I mean, that's the next, that's my way. This is no way. No way. I'm just not going to do anything. And you think if we just don't make a decision, it's kind of like, you know, Pilate standing before you. Well, I just find no fault in him. I just wash my hands of things. I'm not going to do nothing about it. You can't do that in your life. You can't just kind of move into this little place of, of no movement and no choices and, and no decisions because you'll just be paralyzed there and you'll never have anything accomplished in your life. But I know people, that's the way they approach all their problems. I'm just not going to make a decision. But they do not understand that in not making a decision, they made a decision. For me, not to say yes to Jesus is to say what? No. No. Well, Brother Joe, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'd never say that. I would I'd just, boy, that'd just be blasphemous. I wouldn't say, but you do that. Amen. So what's the difference, you know? Because what we really believe and what we're really going to do always shows up within our actions and how we respond that way. You know, we just, we, we'd rather spend one more night with the frogs, perhaps, that if we just, you know, uh, think that if I just, you know, I don't do anything, that something's going to happen now. I don't have to make a decision that frogs are going to get tired of being up here on the land a lot. They'll get back to the river sooner or later. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. Here, here was the, the, the Sinatra way, you know, the old song, I did it my way. Now, what happens when you do it way? Verse 7 tells, it says, and the magicians of the Egyptians, all right, they did the same with their secret arts, and they made frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. I think when Pharaoh went to them and said, hey, guys, we got a frog problem, they went out and tried to stop it, but they just made more frogs come up. They just intensified the problems. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, King Saul, when he went in to see the fortune teller, you know, he got more than he, he wanted in that incident, you know, that it, it was a tremendous surprise that Satan really came and manifested himself in his life then. Folks, uh, listen, if you choose, if this, if this is your way to deal with your problems, I'm just going to do what I want to do anyway. Listen, you're going to have more problems you know what to do with. And sooner or later, they'll just so pile up in your life, it's just going to be one day, all of a sudden, there's going to be this massive problem. And you're going to wonder, how did I get here? How did my marriage end this way? How did my life end up this way? How did my kids end up this way? And it could have been that you failed to respond in the timely manner that God wanted you to respond with your commitment to Him and with your life. I know, I know what it's like to deal with things that keep you in captivity. I think most of us do on some level. We've come out of bondage if we're Christians on some level or another. But I know what that's like, and I know what that struggle is like. I, I, I know what it was like to, to wake up in the morning and, and want to drink. I know what it's like to wake up in the morning and, and, and have to take something to get through the day. And I didn't feel I could be happy if I didn't. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't find peace. But at the same time, I was miserable inside. And I knew I was miserable inside. And I knew part of my misery came from my problem. But you know what I do about my problem? I told you about them in my testimony. I woke up one morning in my apartment, and I was so miserable, and I looked on the wall, and there was this big poster on my wall, and it had this big bowl of, you know, processed marijuana all in it, you know, folding out of the bowl, you know, and on, on the side of the bowl said something like the happy life or something like that, you know, with all this weed paraphernalia around it. And I got thinking, you know, the good life, I think is what it said on it. I, this ain't the good life. This is a miserable way to live your life. You know, I, I don't, I, I just don't, I'm just sick of living this way. And I got out of bed all mad and I reached up and I'm at the ripe old age of 21. 
And I got up and I tore that poster off the wall and tore it in half, threw it down. I said, I can't live like this. And I walked into the living room, sat down at my table there and rolled a joint <laughs> and smoked it. It's bondage. Hated what I was doing, but somehow found comfort in what I was doing. It's the same thing with the alcoholic. You know, you hate what you're doing. And here's the thing about it, you hate yourself even. You start hating the way you're behaving. You start hating the, what you're doing. It, it, you know, but yet you go out and find some kind of comfort in doing it. This is, a, this is just the lie of the enemy. This is how he works. This is the satanic stronghold that he gets in our lives and hooks us with. And some it's not drugs, some it's not alcohol, some it's sexual addictions, some it's food addictions. I mean, it can go on and on with this list. Some can be, it could be an anger issue, but it's an area of bondage in our life. that We, 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 we go to bed mad about it, hating ourselves over it, get up, think I'm not going to do that because tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be a new day and I'm not going to do it, but we end up right back in it. And it's a cycle that's endless until we do what needs to be done. And we come to God and we let God really start getting a hold of our lives. How many people wake up each day and think, you know, I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to be that way today. I'm not going to act that way. I'm not going to respond that way. I'm not going to treat my wife that way. I'm not going to do that to my husband. I'm not going to do that. Uh, and then they end up right back. Yeah. Your way's not working. Yeah. You know, it's just not working. It's the old question, if you get honest with yourself, how's that working for you? When you keep procrastinating and doing what you know you really need to do, which is just finally surrender to Jesus. Get your heart and your life right with God. Let God really take charge in your heart. Let God really take charge in your life. But you don't, and you keep coming back this same old cycle over and over and over again. But tomorrow's going to be the day when you change your life. But tomorrow's only a dream. Unless you're ready to do what God wants you to do. My way. Let me show you what the way we need to do it is, the right way. Amen. And the right way, the solution is when we say to our Heavenly Father, who loves us more than we can even begin to comprehend, who sees us sitting in our little self-loathing kind of attitudes and, and, and God's calling us and drawing us and we're just so preoccupied with ourselves and with our sin, we don't look to Him. But what happens when we open our eyes and we behold him and we start looking to him and we look into him? You say, how do you look at him? You look into his word. You see him clearly. He manifests himself in your very being. He shows you himself. And you get honest with him and you get real with him and you quit putting off anymore what God's called you to do today. You realize the hour and the time is right now. No more tomorrow. It's now is the time to do it and you're going to do it. And the senseless thing would be to know that, but yet not to come to God and get those things really right with him. The hope, is, the Bible says that Jesus said it. It's repentance. What is repentance? You know what it means? It goes back to the first of our message about how we think. How we think. How we think about our sin, how we think about ourselves, how we think about the world, how we think about what really makes us happy. Our thinking's wrong. And it should be relevant by the world we've created around us, by our bad decisions and our bad choices, that it's wrong. Jesus said, repent. Greek word, mentonai, means change your mind. Change it from what? Your mind to God's mind. Your way to God's way. I mean, that was the message preached on the day of Pentecost. Thousands of people were standing around, and Peter gets up, and, you know, he said, listen, God commands all men everywhere to repent. He said, you put Jesus Christ to death, but God has raised him up from the dead and given him a name above every name. That's the Lord. What was their mind? This is the message Peter's preaching. I'm saying what we're preaching today. Their mind was to get rid of Jesus. Their mind was to have Jesus crucified. Let's get him out of the way. It's too convicting. It's too big a standard. It's just too much to deal with. You know, let's get, get rid of Jesus. Now, you might think, well, I would never say crucify him. It's the same when you reject him. All right? My mind is that I want to do what I want. I don't want God telling me what to do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want anybody else telling me what to do because I want to do what I'm going to do. No matter what you do, I, I want what I want. Now, I'm going to have to change my mind. Peter put it this way, God has raised him up from the dead and called him Lord. That's the mind of God. So what should I do? I should raise him up in my life and call him Lord. That's to change my mind correctly. That now Jesus, 
He's Lord. Now, don't miss this. You say, well, I've tried church and I've tried religion. I've tried all those things, Pastor Joe, and it did not work to me. I'm talking about running to the cross of Christ. I'm talking about running to Jesus with everything you've got. I'm talking about throwing yourself into his arms. I'm talking about abandoning your will and your way and your thoughts and your perspectives and your ideas and saying, God, I just want you and what you want. I'm talking about somehow seeing in your heart, mind, and eye the risen Lord Jesus Christ, crucified on your behalf, nailed to a cross on your behalf, shedding his blood on your behalf, but now raised from the dead. And you're going to embrace his life and the same resurrection power that raised him from the dead dwells in you through his Holy Spirit. That's his way. That's the right way, amen? That's the correct way. You need to do this. You don't need to say tomorrow. And I hear what happens. Many times we say today and we come to the altar and we pray today, but then we say, I'm, come Monday, it'll be a new, different, no. It's the moment that starts then and there. There's no delay. There's no procrastination. It's in the moment. Now, if you choose not to, be listening because you're going to start hearing the croaking and the ribbits in the background of the frogs. Why is it so important that we don't put off what God's saying to us? Why is it so important that we do not neglect? Well, one is, I think you need to understand that we're living in the last of the last of the last days. Amen. Jesus Christ is coming again. The Bible says in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that he's going to appear and he's going to take those of us who know him immediately off this planet. It also says, it believes in Matthew, when he talks about Matthew, he says, and when I appear, there will be many who will be ashamed at my coming. You say, well, what's that mean? Let me put it this way. In this instant, I'm going to count to three. And let's say by the time I say three, Jesus is standing here in our midst. What are your first reactions? Because he's going to look around this room and he's going to look you dead in the eyes in a moment. One, two, three. What did he see? Where's your heart? Where's your commitment? Where's your love? But Joe, I'm going to get right with God tomorrow. I'm going to start reading my Bible. Tomorrow, I'm going to start reading my Bible. <laughs> tomorrow, I'm going to really get serious about my prayer life. Tomorrow, I'm finally going to tell those people about Jesus. Tomorrow, Jesus could come any second. What makes you think you can schedule this? You can't schedule this. In Matthew 24, Jesus makes it clear, the day and the hour no one knows. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be you ready for such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. See, none of you would think that Jesus would come in the next three seconds. Oh, maybe later, somebody, everything's lining up. It's lined up. It's lined up already. It could happen any moment. You know what else there's a, there's a risk of? The risk of your sudden death. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto man wants to die in the judgment. We're all sitting here happy and having a good old time. But next Sunday, I could not be here. You could not be here. Because something happened. Whether by accident, heart attack, anything in the world could happen. And we all know people who have experienced those sudden death situations. And it's always so crazy. The Bible says, you know, James says, you know, you, you better say if the Lord wills. <laughs> Because we don't know. You don't know. And so if, if you hear the voice of the Lord speaking, you quit saying tomorrow. You may face him today. And I'd hope you'd face him thinking, man, praise God for first John 1 9 because <laughs> I got my house in order by getting my sins at, uh, to the cross again and getting right with God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for mercy and grace and forgiveness. Thank you for loving me that way. You don't know. Hebrews 9. 27, 3, 7, 3, 15. They all keep saying this word today, 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 today. If you hear his voice today. For the Christian, I'm talking to those of you who know the Lord Jesus personally, if God's been dealing about something, why would you put it off one more day? What is wrong with today? Why, why not do right here in this worship center today what God's been telling you to do for quite some time now? And you've justified it and you've rationalized it and you've excused it and you've come. I mean, you got some really good excuses, but that's all they are, just excuses. They don't hold, they don't, they, don't, they don't stand in the realm of God's presence and reality of God, right? 
Because God's ready to do something for you. God's ready to do something miraculous in your life. God's ready to break some chains. God's ready to transform your heart. God's ready to give you the power to, to, to make the decisions that need to be made today. But yet we're sitting back and making excuses. What happens if I dial and then I didn't listen to what he said to do? And what a waste. What a miserable waste. You know, Paul said, you know, I fear one thing. He said, what was that, Apostle Paul? He said, I fear one thing, that I would become a castaway. I think that's the word he uses in the King James. Castaway. Does it mean he loses his salvation? That's not at all what it means. It basically is a word in the Greek language which means unusable. Not really usable anymore. A really no service anymore. It's like a, it's like a broken laptop, you know. <laughs> it's there, and you might be able to get it turned on, but it won't do anything. And he says, I don't want to be that kind of Christian who just becomes useless in the hands of God, not dependable and not faithful and not committed. In other words, he's saying it's possible. If you read what Peter wrote, he said, he said it's possible to get so far removed in your fellowship with Jesus Christ that you even, you even forget you're a child of God. Read that first chapter. Now, I know people like that. Had a vibrant walk with God at one time, but kept putting God off and putting God off. Well, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. And now their life seems to be overrun with every kind of frog issue you can imagine. They didn't think it would happen. They thought they'd keep putting God off, but now the whole world's colliding in and the whole world is crumbling in. You're, listen, you may think you get away with sin in your life, but dear friends, as your pastor, as your brother in Christ, and as your friend even, you don't get away with anything. You may be good at herding frogs and keeping them in the shadows so that people don't know what's going on, hiding out, you know, kind of avoid the light shining in on your issues. But sooner or later, beware, the Bible says, you will always reap what you've sown. Don't be foolish. It's best to respond to the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know Jesus, goodness gracious, what better moment than now to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? For whatever reason you've put it off, you, you've kind of said, well, I don't really need to do that whole born again thing. I'm, you know, I don't need to really repent and follow Jesus, really make a commitment. And all. Listen, the Bible says you must be born again. I didn't write that, but that is in the imperative format. And if you're going to experience heaven, you're going to experience God in your life, you're going to need to, get, you're going to, need to come to Christ and find life that's in him. The third reason you don't put it off is the risk of your heart becoming hard, which is a terrible risk. It's like that castaway part where Paul says, I don't want to be that guy. In other words, the Spirit of God keeps dealing with us. It, it, listen, none of us would be here today and, and have any inkling of really following Jesus if it weren't for the Holy Spirit in our heart. Do you know that? I mean, that's the Holy Spirit of God. He, he's always convicting us. He's always drawing us. He's always calling us to himself. You just wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't be in your progress that you're in progress. If you're maturing, you wouldn't be maturing without the, with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Thank God for the holy teacher of God. Thank God for his holy presence in our life. Thank God for his conviction. Jesus said, you know, I, I, I came, I proved the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He said the Holy Spirit's going to continue to do the same thing. He's going to come and he's going to correct you and he's going to reprove you and he's going to show you what's righteousness and what judgment is and sin that's in your heart and life. So praise God that when sin is in my life, it doesn't, it, you know, preaching just kind of helps me get there. I already know it's there. I know what's going on in my life. That, you know, God deals with me pretty clear. Does he deal with you? I mean, y'all know what it's like when God speaks to you about something, all right? And when God, but listen, when I, when I step out of the line, I think God keeps me on a shorter leash. I don't know because, you know, I start moving this way and bloop, then get pulled. <laughs> Where do you think you're going, arms? You know, what are you doing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty good friends with me and Jesus, all right, but I always feel like he calls me arms instead of Joe. I don't know what that is, but, but arms. You ever hear that in your heart? Not arms, but, you know, preach it. What are you doing? Preach it, you know. What's up, Sanders? What's the matter with you? And it's kind of like there's that, it's very clear voice when I, when I step out of line. Is it with you? It's very clear. Hey, I know it. Nobody has to get up and do a sermon on thou shalt not act stupid. <laughs> all right? I just got it down, all right? I know when I act stupid. And it's clear and it's crystal clear. But you know what happens if I say no to the Lord in that deal? Arms. And again, arms. 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 And it's not that he's not speaking any louder. It's that my heart is getting harder. And I grew up in West Texas. I had a relatives that had a had a, had a ranch out there. They raised sheep and they raised cattle. 
There's a few summers I'd go out there. I didn't like going out. That was hard work. But sometimes, it's, you know, it's the only work that was around as a teenager. So I'd go out and help. Hated baling hay loading hay bales, you know. Somebody got smart, made those things giant with a truck, picks them up now. That's nice. Those hay bales, you know, you throw those all day and those, you get beat up. One thing we did, we'd, we'd, we'd brand cattle too. We'd help brand the cattle. You know, they'd get in there and they'd get the cows out and they'd take them and they'd put them on the ground and, you know, I'd be over there heating up irons for the guy and, you know, sometimes there's a brand new brand on this calf. And you talk about screaming. You take that hot iron, put it on the flesh, and you smell that burnt flesh going, and that calf, <laughs> well, I would too, you know. And it's a hard, hot iron. Sometimes they came back for a rebrand. A year or two gone by for years, and they rebrand that, but there wouldn't be as near as much screaming and squealing because all that skin was dead. All the nerves had been killed. I think that's the same way when we first sense the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our life, that it's a, it's a burning, searing conviction. Oh, God, I know you're right. That's right. And I know I need to get right. But what happens the more we put God off? We start getting hard-hearted. We're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit as much. And every time we say no, 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 we keep experiencing the same hardness of heart. That's a hard thing, by the way, because when, the, when, the, when it seems that you no longer hear God's strong, convicting voice, then you're in trouble. For you that are here without Christ today, I would say there's probably some, if not many, because it's easy, I know, to go through religion and not have Jesus. It's easy to put on a show. It's easy to, and in fact, it's easier than getting saved <laughs> to have your own little system of works that you just kind of satisfy your conscience with. Because if you want to get saved, you've got to come die, give your life to Jesus. Amen. But that's where life is. If anyone come after me, let him take up the cross. We've got to come to the place of death to ourselves. But if you're here without Christ, there is a day when God will quit dealing with you. I don't know when it is. But I, I, it's kind of like you cross over in what I call death row, tombstone territory. You, God has dealt with you. He's dealt with you. He's dealt with you. He's dealt with you. In fact, in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis, says, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. If you follow the story of Pharaoh, remember, Pharaoh kept changing his mind and changing his mind and changing his mind. It says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. A bunch of times. And then finally it says, right before it was all said and done, and before the last plague of death came, it says, so God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In other words, it's over. Do we think that we just have any old time, that we can just come anymore? You don't come. The Bible says no man comes unless the Spirit calls him. So if God's calling, it's time to answer and respond. You know what the fourth reason is? Why we shouldn't neglect him, why we shouldn't put this off? If you don't know Jesus Christ, you risk losing your soul. Now, hell's not a top, talked about in churches much anymore, right? It's not real palatable. It's not real positive. So we don't mention hell. It's all right to write books and preach on heaven. But let's not talk about hell. But I've got some news for you, folks. Just as much as heaven's reality, hell's reality. You can't go to the Bible and say, I like that heaven stuff, but I'm not going to deal with that hell stuff. That's not going to take hell out of the Bible. It's not going to take hell out of reality. It's not going to take hell out of eternity. It's still there. And everyone is going there who hasn't committed their heart to Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of popular theology out there and open theism and all these ideas that kind of always all lead to the same, all paths lead to the same place. Well, yes, they do. All but one. They all lead to hell unless you're on the path that leads to Jesus. Jesus said it, not me. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. Amen. Amen. And I believe him. I believe him. There's, a, there's many ways the Bible said which seem right unto a man, but the end of those ways is destruction. But it looked right, and it sounded right, and I just told myself it was right. But it always leads to destruction. If you're here without Jesus Christ today, and if we get to the end of this message in just a moment, there will be men standing here in this altar today who will gladly share with you the simple 
truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which basically says repent and believe. Give your heart to Christ and follow Jesus. That's what it all boils down to. Follow Christ. Be a Jesus follower. Commit yourself to Christ. And we'll pray with you, and you can make that declaration that we all make if we're going to walk with God. I trust you, Christ. You are my Lord. You are my King. I'm following. And we follow. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of faith. And it's a confession of faith. But the other option, folks, is to lose your soul in all of eternity. I don't want to be a Pharaoh who hardens my heart to ultimately God just walks away and my heart is completely hardened. What are we waiting for? I think that some folks just think, well, you know, maybe Pharaoh's thinking, yeah, I bet if I just put this off one more day, then frogs will go back to the river by themselves. They do like water. They'll just go away. It'll be better tomorrow. And I won't have to do what I'm being told to do and what God wants me to do. I, I can do what I want to do. But folks, deliverance was available today, all right? But rebellion, disobedience, those things that we tend to hold on to even, and there is pleasure in sin for a season, and we have a tendency to fall in love with our sin. But none of those things are going to bring you life. You know, none of those things. And here's the worst part of it. Here's the part we don't see. Because we don't think spiritually. We don't think safely. We don't see that when we choose for ourselves over God, we've chosen to disregard the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We've chosen to disregard and to think it's invaluable, unimportant, not relevant the suffering that he experienced on the cross. We've chosen, and you want to know something that's offensive to God? That's offensive to God. God tells us in the book of Hebrews, I will not allow you to trample underfoot the blood of my son. I'm just not going to allow you to do that. And what it is, and this is the, again, it's that part we're blinded to and we don't think about it. How can I, who understand clearly the love of God and letting Jesus come, suffer for me, be nailed to a cross like a criminal, stripped of his clothing, humiliated in front of the masses, mocked at, scourged, and beaten with an inch of his life. His very flesh peeled off his body. Blood pouring from him so that I could have all this stuff forgiven. That I could have my sins, though crimson, be washed away. May God give us another prophet of Isaiah who stood before the people and said in his day, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll wash them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be white as wool. We don't want to reason. We live in our insanity. Come, forget the no way. Forget about the later way. Forget about the my way. Choose the right way. There's a passage, I'll close with two verses, one I have on the screen for you. It's in Hebrews. Again, he fixes a certain day, saying through David, after so long a time, just as this been, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now catch that verse. He fixes a certain day. God says, I've got a day set for you to get right. Is it Monday, Wednesday, or Sunday? No, today. What's so special about that? When you hear his voice, don't put it off when God speaks to you. Don't say no. Don't say later. Don't say maybe. Don't say, I need some more information. <laughs> Amen. Today, if God's speaking to you, choose him. Trust him. Believe him. Follow him, surrender to him. If you hear his voice, that's the day that God has fixed for all of us to get right because we don't know what a day may bring forth. Two Wednesdays ago, we were in Proverbs 27, and I shared this verse from chapter 1. It says, boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you don't, do not know what a day may bring forth. Don't be bragging about tomorrow. Don't be thinking about tomorrow. You think about today in your relationship. Be safe-minded. Be sober-minded. Get your heart and your life right with God. I think this is a perfect and appropriate message to follow up last week when we talked about crisis at the crossroad. Because what Moses did, remember, he stood in the gate of the camp and he called for a decision of all those people who were rebelling against God. 
And it was the same message, let's, you know, all those who are ready to go with God, walk with God, come. It's the same today. It's the same today. And maybe last week you came to the altar and you said, yes, Lord, amen, and tomorrow I'm going to deal with that. <laughs> That's not the way you deal with it. It's today I'm going to deal with this. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, in the name of Jesus, you know each and every one of our lives in this room. You know exactly what's going on with the one of us, every one of us. And Lord, help us to understand that what you're calling us to is really to life and to freedom, to liberation. May we be sensitive to hear your voice today and to respond to your call. God, give us a willingness today. Stir us up, convict us, draw us, whatever needs to be. If our hearts have grown hard, God, break up that hard soil. Plow a little deeper, Father. Don't let us escape the beauty of your conviction and the beauty of your Holy Spirit speaking to us. May you call each of us uniquely to your path, to your purposes, to your will. It's in your name we pray. With your head bowed, in just a moment we're going to begin to sing. Decisions that need to be made can only be made by you. And whatever it is that you've been stuck in, move out of that. Move away from that. Trust the Lord today with it. As a Christian, maybe it's between you and the Lord, come find a place to pray. Get back to 1 John 1, 9. And confess those things to God and ask Him to wash you and forgive you, to cleanse you. Adjustments that need to be made, make them today. Decisions that need to be made, make them today. Phone call needs to be made, make it today. Whatever it is that God's dealing with you about, today is the day. That's the day He's fixed, the day He's speaking to us, the day we hear His voice. If you're looking for a church home, you believe this is where God's leading you, you come, share it with one of these men in the altar. I believe it's where the Lord wants me to serve Him. If you don't know Jesus Christ, come to any one of them and say, listen, I want to give my life to Christ today. Let us rejoice with you in that decision. Maybe you just want somebody to pray for you. You can bring someone with you. You can pray with anyone saying the altar. But whatever it is, as we sing this chorus, you come. You step out. You obey the Lord. Come now, would you? Trust the Lord. Let's obey Christ. Come.